Okay, we are now live recording the Artificial Intelligence Risk Management SOP walkthrough. And just a, you know, FYI, we will be pushing out this recording after the presentation and also a link to the slides uh, if, in case you want to review those. So just up front, you know, who are we? Why are you, why should you listen to us? That's you know certainly a fair question, and I will let Rob introduce himself, and then I will will take the mic back and introduce and and speak to you about my background. But Rob, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, sir. So I'm uh, Robert Wood. I go by Rob. Answered all. Um, I am currently a CISO at a uh, uh, federal agency, and I've been in the startup scene. I've been in consulting. I'm now uh, now doing this and. And I'm just a tech nerd all around, so I've been uh, uh, I've been very excited about this this craze, this phase that we are in with all of the uh, all of the the chatter and the use cases and the the developments happening around generative AI and and of course like you know it's sort of sort of same thing happened when like cloud services burst on the scene and and continuous deployment burst on the scene and there's there's this rush to innovate and then this uh this rush to secure after the fact and so you know i think we've got this really unique opportunity to kind of do it along like do it at the same time instead of get that bolt on you know, at the very end so so that's me in a nutshell awesome thank you so i'm walter haydock and I'm the founder and CEO of StackAware, which is a cyber risk management company. Prior to that, I worked at uh, two enterprise software companies. The most recent one was Privacera, which was a data access governance startup. So focused on controlling access to sensitive data. So I've got a, a pretty deep background in this. And then prior to that, I went to business school and uh, before then served most of my time in government in a variety of roles primarily in the intelligence community and overseeing the Department of Homeland Security on Capitol Hill. So I have a lot of experience in understanding the implications of sensitive data and why you should protect it. And also at the same time, enabling mission operations by using that data rather than just putting it in a silo and sitting on it. So with that, I will move on and open up with this quotation, which I think is uh, really apropos right now. It's it's decades old, but, you know, as Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think we're seeing people react to developments in generative AI as if they are magic. And you're all smart people. You know that this isn't magic. It's It's just another development, another innovation that can enable organizations to move faster, to develop products more effectively, to enhance safety, to um, you know get people uh, better educated, to improve their standard of living. So huge opportunities here. At the same time, there are risks, no doubt, from using generative AI. And um, you know, I think the reactions to it from the security community have been a little bit concerning and have have kind of aired toward the side of treating generative AI like it's magic, which we all know that it is not. The uh, headlines here, as you can see, a lot of organizations are banning the use of chat GPT. Apple, I think, might be somewhat of an outlier because they've got their own internal tool, but if you look at these financial companies banning it, uh, you know, they're not developing their own. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, LLMs to, uh, you know, allow workers to do their tasks. So I think this is a, a fear of the unknown. But of course, there are risks and there are already some instances of organizations potentially suffering data leaks as a result of improper use or unmoderated use of these technologies. So you've got this Amazon example and then Samsung as well, where some Workers may have leaked proprietary code and some meeting notes to ChatGPT with the uh, training opt-out uh, not not completed. They they were they were opted uh, they were still opted into training, which allowed ChatGPT to essentially take that information and potentially regurgitate it to competitors um, and and to others. So that is something that you should certainly avoid. And I'll I'll talk through in detail in this SOP 
you know, what steps to take when you are setting up your security program specifically with, with respect to generative AI. All right, so I'm gonna go through two scenarios today and we're going to use the AI SOP or AI risk management SOP as a guide for how to use this tool in these two situations. I'm going to pause here and just check to see if there are any questions before I dive in. Um, if you want to ask a question, please do raise your hand and I will stop at an appropriate moment and address that question, but please don't jump in because uh, it, it might throw me off a little bit. So I'll pause here. Um, please raise your hand if you have any questions, otherwise I will proceed ahead. Okay, seeing none. All right, so scenario one, you are leading security at an e-commerce company that is servicing EU customers and where the company is, isn't actually that relevant because the European uh, General Data Protection Regulation applies to anyone who is uh, has even one European Union uh, resident as a customer, which is most businesses these days. So in this situation, the marketing team wants to use a new software as a service, artificial intelligence tool to analyze existing customer data, including age, gender, and location to identify upsell targets for a new product line. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to flip over to the risk management SOP and I'm gonna walk through the decision flow that you would apply in this scenario. And I'm gonna ask for some participation. Um, if I ask a question, like for somebody to, to answer, you know, or, or suggest a step, you don't need to raise your hand, you can just jump in um, and I'll let you know when that is. So. Let me flip over to the SOP. All right, so this is a draw.io file. You can download it for free. It's free right now. I'm probably gonna make some improvements to it and eventually make this uh, a paid product. I think uh, this, is, this is pretty detailed and uh, I think organizations can, can gain a lot from it. But just to tee things up, this has a lot of information about the structure of the SOP. I won't get into it because you have access to it right now, but the, the five key players here are the business unit leader, and that person is going to be the ultimate uh, decision maker for any risk decisions. That person is going to be driving this process. As a security person, I think that business leaders should be in the, uh, in the driver's seat on these decisions. They should be getting support from their privacy, their legal and procurement and security teams. But these folks are advisors and implementers along the way they should not be owning risk because they're not the ones who are best equipped or best, um, they don't have all the information about all the risks that the organization faces, whether they're competitive, regulatory, legal, technological, what have you. So business leaders should be driving these decisions in, in my humble opinion. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start, you know, at the beginning, a, a good place to, to go. And assume someone in the organization requests an AI tool, which is the marketing team in this case. Uh, this is the first step needs to be, there, there has to be some sort of machine readable process for tracking these requests. Now it could, be, it could be Jira, it could be Excel, it could be if you have a GRC tool for managing, for managing vendors, you can use that as well. But whatever you use, it needs to be written down. It can't be uh, just kind of seat of the pants and um, I know there are even organizations or there, there are vendors out there that track these types of seat of the pants um, registrations for external SaaS tools and things like that. But you, you want to have a kind of a, uh, you know, an affirmative uh, method of, of entering this information into uh, wherever you track it. And, and then also optimally have that tied into your risk register, uh, you know, any product tracking tools and anywhere that your organization keeps this information. So, so the next step is going to be this business leader. Uh, and this, this should be the first step before you even do, do any sort of risk analysis about an AI tool from a cyber or privacy perspective. You need to understand what is the business case for this tool? Is this tool being requested because somebody sees AI a lot on their social media feeds and they don't want to be left out? Or is this really going to improve productivity for the organization? Is this going to 
you know, help it accomplish a critical mission objective. And, you know, if, if there's another way to do, it, do this that's more cost effective, not including the security or, or privacy risk, but just from a pure business perspective, then, you know, this request needs to get rejected offhand. Uh, and, and I would recommend, you know, applying just a little bit of friction from a business perspective, making sure that people are, are making a business case for acquiring a tool or deploying a new model before, uh, you know, they go all in. You, you don't want to shut it down, but you want to say, hey, what is, what is the use case here? And that's, that's going to be a business leader making the call here. So uh, we're going to presume in this case that the AI SaaS tool is, is the most cost-effective way to proceed. Uh, and that kind of brings us to a uh, important next question. And this is something that the privacy team, uh, whoever that is in your organization, if it's a small team, it might just be, you know, your only security engineer, or it might even be just kind of a, you know, uh, a, a CFO if, it, if, it's a, if it's a startup. But whoever is making this call um, needs to ask, are you processing personal data, personally identifiable information, or uh, protected health information? Now, those are all separate legal categories, but um, they describe a general type of information that under GDPR is called personal data. And, and that's your first step. So can anyone help me? What is the answer to this question right now? You can drop it in the chat or just jump in. No one. <laughs> I feel like this, I, I was trying to start easy here. I feel like this, uh, this could be a, a pretty simple one. Anyone want to help me out here? Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. So in this scenario, are we processing uh, personal data, PII, or PHI? And you might have missed the initial scenario tee up. If so, then that might be difficult to answer. But uh, for anyone who, who was there at the intro. Personal data. Yes. Yay. Yes. We are processing personal data under the GDPR because you could uniquely identify an individual with the information um, that I that I described. You know, it, it's potential gray area, but this is something that the privacy team is going to want to do an analysis on. So uh, it's going to kick you into the, the next step, which the privacy uh, team will conduct a more detailed risk analysis. So here are some things to think about when you're considering acquiring a AI tool from a privacy perspective. What are the uh, data protection addenda and uh, data processing addenda that you have with the vendor? If there is a vendor, it may be an open source model. We'll talk about that in the second scenario. If a, one of your customers submits a data sat subject access request or a, um, a data subject deletion request, how are you going to process that? Are you, uh, you know, if the data resides with a third party, they might have their own process that you might need to get in the middle of. You may need to act on behalf of a customer uh, to interface with that vendor to process that, uh, that DSAR or deletion request. So, you know, this is not a simple thing. You need to map this out and have a, a well-defined policy, you know, a privacy policy on your website, but also a standard operating procedure, like who is going to submit the form to the vendor to request this? How are we going to adjudicate this decision? Because not every deletion request is necessarily a valid one. There are sometimes legal justifications, depending on what regulation you're talking about for retaining that data despite a deletion request. But figuring all this out ahead of time before somebody, you know, and it could very well be an activist who is, you know, very up in arms about uh, data processing, you wanna make sure that you have a, a well-established plan for how you're going to handle these requests before you, you know, hit hit the purchase button on the on the AI tool. Okay. Basically, there are two outcomes from this. There's one: is this within our risk appetite from a privacy perspective, or is it not within our risk appetite? If it's, uh, you know, th that's going to be a, a difficult question. I do a lot of writing on my blog, deploy securely, about how to quantitatively evaluate cybersecurity risk. I've done some recent issues uh, specifically on AI related privacy and cybersecurity risk. So you should definitely check those out. And this is gonna come down to the organization and the privacy team should make a recommendation, should assess whether this is within or outside of the existing uh, risk appetite from a privacy perspective, and then make, make, a, make a suggestion. It's not a decision. The privacy team is not blocking anything here. They're just making a recommendation. So the uh, next piece is, 
assuming that this is within the risk, risk appetite, you can go ahead and update your privacy policy and your standard operating procedures, as, as I described, to handle this um, data deletion. But if you're outside of your risk uh, appetite, then you're going to need to go down and go back to that business owner and say, hey, are you willing to accept this marginal risk above our appetite for the specific situation for this tool? Is the business case that compelling that you want to do this? Maybe so. In which case, anytime you get a risk acceptance, that's something that needs to be documented. And the security team, the security team should not be signing off on this. This should not be a CISO or, or chief privacy officer signature. This should be a business unit leader signature with the, uh, you know, the, the CISO or the security team managing the process. But a business leader needs to be the one making that decision. And then you go back into the workflow and, um, and then you basically assume that the, the risk has been accepted at this point or what well, has been. And then you can proceed along as if it were within your appetite. All right, I see a question. I'm going to take a look. Would you need to confirm that the algorithm isn't being updated with customer information as input data? So good question. Uh, I'm going to address that uh, as, as part of uh, this workflow. Good question. Just, just hold on for uh, a few minutes. We will, we will definitely get to that. Okay, so the next question is, um, is our company operating the AI model? So people will use the term SaaS and on-prem. I don't love those because there are a lot of things that aren't SaaS or on-prem. Um, I use customer operated or customer managed um, as, as, my, as my terminology. So in this case, we're using an AI SaaS tool. Is our company operating the AI model? Yes or no? I'm sure no, someone knows the answer to this one. All right, everybody's ready for the weekend, I guess. No, yes, that is correct. We are not. We are not operating the model in this case. This third party is. It's a. It's a software as a service. A vendor is operating the model uh, on our behalf. Okay. So that gets into a. Uh, you know the situation of data retention. So when you are using a third party to uh, process data on your behalf, you're all things being equal. You're going to want to limit the amount of data retained. Just you know unless there's a business use case to, uh, to do so, you less data in other people's hands is better, all other things being equal. So there are a couple of things you can do to limit this retention. For example, um, if you're using GPT 3.5 or 4, if you use the um, chat interface, OpenAI has a very vague retention policy that kind of says like, we can retain this for as long as we need for our business purposes. And as long as it's, it's lawful. So to me, that basically says they could retain your data indefinitely. They could take your prompts and store them forever. Now, if you're using the API, they have a documented 30-day data retention period. So in that case, you'd want to prefer using the, uh, the API to the, uh, the, to the UI, all things being equal. Again, certainly there are, um, you know, uh, it's it's certainly easier to use the UI. There are plugins available. You can use the browse capability, which isn't available on the on the uh, API right now. So there might be a use case, but this is all about mitigating risk. We're not, you know, we're never going to eliminate the risk here. So what you should do, you you could consider building your own proprietary in interface that just plugs into the Chat GPT API uh, rather than going directly to their UI, because that way you can retain data for or have them retain data for a shorter period of time. And then if you're using Azure OpenAI services, you can actually um, implement customer managed encryption keys, which allows you to encrypt your data in Azure, uh, but you hold the keys, which essentially allows you to, to crypto shred it if you, if you want. You can delete the keys and that data is functionally unrecoverable. Quantum decryption not with, notwithstanding. <laughs> So you want to limit your your data retention uh, in this third party. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep pushing. Some some other things that you'll want to do is uh, to reduce your your risk from a privacy and a security perspective, uh, privacy and, and uh, compliance perspective is uh, 
limiting the monitoring that's going on. So um, for example, Microsoft will and OpenAI will monitor the prompts for abuse, you know, to make sure people aren't trying to use ChatGPT or OpenAI uh, models to create malware or you know do do things like that. So they have human reviewers, and then they also have algorithmic content moderation of those prompts. Now it's possible to opt out of these things if there are justifications for it. For example, if you're processing uh, protected health information, then you know that'd be a good justification to forbid. Um, Microsoft from doing that manual content moderation or that that mo that manual abuse monitor or abuse uh, monitoring. So you'll look at this from both a uh, a privacy and a, a legal or procurement process uh, perspective. And then if if you have a, a reasonable justification to avoid or to not do content filtering, then go ahead and, and make that request. And you know obviously you may need to litigate that with whoever the provider is, but. Um, you know, definitely make make the make the case if it's there. Okay, so once that's done, you're going to move on to the third party cyber risk analysis. So this is kind of, this is a more traditional TPRM um, or vendor risk management approach. There are lots of uh, things you can do to evaluate this. I, I probably can't get into all of them here. I do have a lot of references here that link to some articles I've written on this topic, ways to evaluate a third party. Um, Okay, so basically at this point, you've got, uh, you've got two options. You know, either the risk exceeds your appetite or the risk is within your appetite. We've already covered what happens if, it's, uh, if you need a risk acceptance. So I'm just gonna go back up uh, to the next step here. Okay, this part is uh, the contractual risk analysis. This is um, more focused on the intellectual property uh, produced by the model. And I'll, I'll give you an example here. So OpenAI says that the output from chat GPT is uh, the, the copyright to that is assigned immediately to the creator of the prompt. So that's that's fine from, from an intellectual property perspective. There are no, um, no issues there because you own the copyright as soon as you generate that content. Now, where there could be issues are all these open source LLMs that are coming out. And I'll talk a little bit more about local uh, models is um, they have weird licensing restrictions on them that are, you know, they're, they're traditional ones like Apache 2. I, I mentioned GPL3, which is definitely one you should watch out for because you're basically required to make your entire tech stack uh, or anything built on top of that model open source. Uh, there are some weird models out there that say like, if you have over a million dollars revenue, then you need to pay a license fee. But if it's under a million, then you don't. So you definitely need to pay close attention to these licensing requirements and, and understand what the uh, intellectual property ownership looks like. So you know, this is gonna be the same uh, two, two decisions, like is it within risk, uh, is it outside the risk appetite or is it within the risk appetite? And then you know, if, it's, if it's not within the risk appetite, it goes to the business leader to make that call. Okay, assuming we're within the risk appetite, this is the question that uh, Emmanuel uh, mentioned, which is, do we need to train the model on the inputs? So this is uh, where, you know, from a, from a privacy perspective, uh, I would say there's almost never a business case to train a model on personal data. Um, you know, if you're using email addresses, phone numbers, names, things like that, there, there probably isn't a, a use case um, to train specifically on that type of data. I mean, there may be, uh, there may be, and that's why, you know, you've got flexibility in this SOP. But if, you, if you're training, uh, if you don't need to train on the inputs, then don't. So, uh, for example, ChatGPT allows you to train to opt out of uh, training on data via the UI. You're automatically opted out if you use the API. So you need to look at whatever service, whatever tool you're considering using, and you should opt out. Um, you know, in, in most cases. Now, there may be cases, for example, if you're doing something highly technical, um, you know, you're trying to train it on your code base. Uh, that could be a reason where you would want to opt in to uh, to the the training on your data. And again, if there's a business case for that, then then by all means do it. So I included this later on in the workflow because this is applicable not just to privacy um, uh, use cases, but uh, privacy is definitely one of the places where it could be important. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and, and something something I wanted to chime in here with is. I have observed in many 
organizations, especially the larger organizations, uh, but I guess, it, I mean, it's certainly prevalent in startups too, is, there you go. Um, sorry, wife calling, is um, this, this tendency to, like there's this bifurcation of security and privacy engagement, especially going through like uh, governance processes or, or sort of vendor onboarding or, you know, things, things like that when you would really want there to be this, this tight alignment. And that is like one of the things we're like really driving home in this, in this flow chart is the fact that there are risks present in both of those, uh, both of those disciplines that are very real and like making sure that you are working together in, in lockstep between cybersecurity needs, interests, requirements, and privacy needs, interests, requirements is just, is super important. A hundred percent. Yeah. You, you can't look at these things in a vacuum because you're going to have some weird, uh, some weird results. Um, you know, I've been in, in a big organization before where I kind of get like semi random requests from the privacy team, like, you know, can you confirm you use encryption in, in this use case? And then, you know, I'd answer the question and, and not really hear from them again. I guess that was a, a two-way street. Uh, you know, I probably should have been, been tight, more tightly linked with them, but uh, I learned my lesson and that's, that's why I created this, this chart. All right, so, so moving on, uh, you're gonna start implementing some technical controls. I have three different technical control groups, A, B, and C. A is over here. Um, yeah, A is over here. This is the plan to reduce retention. And then B and C, B is your documented plan to limit database access of the tool. So it's, uh, you know, if you're, if you're scrappy and you're, you know, if you, if you code yourself uh, and, and you're just setting something up, you know, it's tempting to really just have an API call that returns everything. Like, you know, hey, why not? Like, why shouldn't the API call return the entire database, every column? Um, there are a lot of reasons why not <laughs> from, from a privacy and security perspective, um, but you should make it as difficult as possible for the model to consume data that it should not be consuming. So if, like I mentioned in the use case, we've got customer data, I'm sure in your customer database, you're going to have first name, last name, email, phone number, and then you're going to have, you know, gender, uh, location, age, things like that. And those are the things that the model is training on, the latter things. So when you provide it to the AI tool, you don't want to just send or you don't want the, the AI tool, you know, making a get request to your database and the database returning every single column that it has, um, because that just increases the likelihood that you're going to uh, provide data that you shouldn't be. What you should do is you should provide a, a customer ID, uh, something like that, and then that information I mentioned um, to minimize the amount of data that you're providing to the tool. And then you can just ask the, the AI tool, hey, you know, what's the recommendation for customer number one, two, three, what have you. So some of the things you can do, you know, I mentioned limited database use, you can create a virtual private database, um, which is essentially uh, a similar concept to a virtual private network. You, you only can access certain pieces of information uh, from the database. Um, and it's, it's much more difficult to uh, have that accidental contamination or, or cross-pollination. Okay, so the, the next step would be uh, documenting a plan to prevent sensitive data flow to the AI tool that is separate from uh, section B. Section B is kind of an architectural thing. Section C would be kind of a human error type, type thing. So for example, if I'm copying and pasting you know, code um, and I just hit control C from, uh, you know, from my IDE where I'm working and maybe I did something that I'm not supposed to do and I hard coded a secret in, into my code instead of storing it as an envir environment variable. Okay, now I've got uh, an API key or credential in, in memory and I do control V and now I send it to the AI tool. So that's not something you should be doing. That's, uh, you, you should avoid that to the, the extent possible, but you should assume that people are gonna do these things. I mean, people put hard coded credentials in code all the time. So people are gonna accidentally copy and paste credentials into AI tools. And now what we don't want is AI tools, you know, intentionally or unintentionally figuring out the, you know, your AWS API keys or, you know, figuring out that Walter has a certain password pattern that he always likes to use. And I could probably guess, you know, what his, what his next password would be. You don't want that happening. 
So there are some technical controls you can use. For example, I have an open source project called GPT Guard, which will redact anything that looks like a name, anything that looks like a, a credential. It's a Python package you can get for free. And then there are proprietary tools like Protect AI. I, you know, I haven't used them, but I've seen them. They're, they've got an interesting approach where in your Jupyter Notebook, if you're doing some data science projects and you accidentally try to send an API key to the, to the LLM, then it will, uh, it will warn you and prevent that data from going. All right, so assuming that we've done all this, uh, we can move on to training users on the policy for the, um, for the, for the tool. And I've got a, a template security policy here. Um, it's, it's on my blog, it's freely available, it's licensed Apache 2, feel free to grab this and, uh, and use it. And it links up pretty well with this, with this SOP. And basically it just explains user responsibilities, um, you know, some of the steps I described here. So I won't dive into that because we're, we're already running short on time, but make sure you have a policy, make sure people are trained on it. Okay, at this point, the rest request is approved um, by, the, by the business unit leader. Um, and then the security team needs to certify this tool in a database, wherever you're tracking in the first place, Jira, your vendor risk management platform, your risk register, whatever it is, you'll wanna you know, record that people can use this tool so that they know, you know okay, this is certified for this type of data. And then uh, the security team is going to want to confirm implementation of all these technical controls. So you might have, you know, this might be a pre-procurement decision or analysis done by the security team. And then, as I've often seen happen, where you get all these well-laid plans to apply all these controls, and then the tool is bought, and then the security team has another fire to go fight. And they kind of forget about the implementation, and they expect the business team to do it. And then it doesn't happen. And then, you know, there's an emergency because, oh, these controls were never put in place and there's an incident. So the uh, security team should establish clear deadlines by when these controls are gonna be in place. Uh, and if they don't get into place, then that's a risk acceptance decision by the, uh, by the business owner. And if you don't have the controls in place that you agreed to, you're gonna need to sign off again on top of uh, the original risk acceptance. And hey, maybe that's the right call, but you know, business owner might say, hey, no, let's press pause. Like we're not, we're not moving forward with this project until we get these controls in place. And then also you're going to want to do a periodic re-review uh, of, of any, you know, tool you have in your stack. I made this 365 days. You can tailor it as appropriate, but this basically kicks you back to the, uh, to the start of the cycle. All right. Uh, any questions on that before we pause and, and move on to the next scenario, which is going to be a little different and cover some other aspects of this SOP? Okay, seeing none. All right, so uh, at this halfway point, Rob and I wanna tell you about this upcoming cohort that we're having where all the information that we're doing, that we're providing right now, this is just kind of a taste. This is the appetizer of what we're gonna be doing in this really in-depth course, looking at the cybersecurity, privacy, compliance and governance implications of AI technologies like ChatGPT, like BARD. Um, it's gonna be four live sessions, uh, two hours each. And it's gonna be later in July. And we already have like a great crew of students who have been accepted into this program. We've got one from Microsoft, one from Forescout, one from Zscaler. We've got uh, folks from, from really impressive backgrounds and organizations. And if you're interested, uh, please sign up. You're, you're probably on, on the email list already if you're in this course or if you're in this webinar but head to maven.com slash harness dash AI to take a look and uh, would love to see you in the full course if you find this value. Okay, we're gonna move on to scenario number two. And in this case, we have the same company, same uh, organization, same constraints, but in this case, the engineering team wants to manage an open source large language model themselves using AWS to use as a coding copilot. There are no plans to provide personal data to this copilot. It's just going to be code and providing recommendations on best practices, autocomplete, things like that. All right, so we're gonna go back to the SOP and we're gonna go to the section right here, which is, does the AI tool process personal data, PII or PHI? No. Correct. We are not. We're not planning to. We're not planning to. There are, we still need to have controls just in case. 
Uh, and that's that's what I talked about with GPT Guard and things like that. But we're not planning to. So that moves us to the next question, which is, is the AI tool, AI tool processing the organization's confidential data? So what is the answer to this question? Possibly. Yes, yes, Cer certainly at a minimum, possibly. Um, uh, I would say uh, if you're if you're doing code, uh, any sort of code training, that that would that would be highly likely to be confidential data. You don't want that information falling into your competitors' hands. So uh, this is going to kick us off to the left and into this question of: Is our company operating the AI model? Anyone? Can anyone help me out with this? It is open source. It is an open source LLM, but are we operating the model? Are you saying, are you saying yes? Manual. Okay, I'll, I'll take that as a yes. And that's correct. We are, we are operating the model ourselves. We're running it in our AWS subscription. So um, I'm not going to include a third party uh, risk analysis uh, in general of AWS as part of this because you know, that would make this a little bit uh, clunky, but some specific things to think about with respect to AI um, would be, you know, what's the risk of misconfiguration um, in this environment if we're running this ourselves? If you look at, you know, AWS S3 buckets are like very, very commonly misconfigured and they're left open to the internet all the time. Just Google, you know, AWS S3 misconfigurations. They're like people who track, every time there's an S3 misconfiguration. And there are huge amounts of data that are left exposed just because it's tricky to do the permissions. I know AWS has made some changes recent, recently, but it's very tricky to do the permissions. And you're you're kind of expected, if you're running the, the model yourself, you need to safeguard it. You need to protect it. You need to make sure that you have applied all the controls where a lot of these things might be uh, on the SaaS provider side if you're just doing an API call or logging into a web application. And then another thing to look at is data retention. So if you look at the Google Workspace um, user agreement, they all will retain your data for, for six months uh, after it's deleted. That's after it's deleted. There's no auto delete unless you can set a data retention policy, which you probably should, but it's, it's retained for at least six months after you delete it. So that's substantially more than 30 days from the OpenAI API. So you know, that's something to look at as well is how long are they retaining your data, even if you delete it. And then, um, you know, I mentioned crypto shredding earlier, even if you delete it and they say it's deleted, there's still a chance that it's not fully deleted. Um, that's true with, with a, you know, a SaaS app as well, but it's true with an infrastructure as a service provider like AWS. Some other things to look at are, you know, delaying security updates. Even if, even if you're using an infrastructure as a service provider like AWS, you might be responsible for applying security patches in certain situations, which you wouldn't need to do if you're if you're doing a SaaS model or, or a vendor managed model. So you, you need to weigh the risk reward there. Like, are you, do you have a well documented and implemented vulnerability management program to make sure that the environment is being updated um, sufficiently quickly? You know, again, that, that's a risk analysis you need to do. And then you need to look at what are the security implications of running this open source code? Like, what uh, are the risks of this being some sort of Trojan horse? I mean, there are tons of malicious, tons of malicious packages out there. And I know specifically some attackers are targeting uh, packages that interact with ChatGPT because of all the interest in the space. So you need to do a, a thorough software supply chain analysis to make sure that you aren't, you know, introducing something that's going to call back to, uh, you know, a malicious actor or even accidentally, you know, the, the open source package provider may be collecting some sort of telemetry that you aren't fully sure about. Um, and that could, you know, that might be causing you to leak some, some data if you're, if you're not paying close attention to it. So, so keep that in mind. Um, and then, you know, you've got your decision here of like, you know, is the risk appetite within uh, the, or is, your, is the risk within your appetite or is it not? If it's not, then you need a risk acceptance. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll assume that it is, and we'll go down to the uh, contractual risk analysis section again. Some things that I mentioned are, you know, what is the um, 
you know, what is the licensing of this open source model? You need to be very careful here because you might, your developers might get pretty far along when you realize, oh, this is a GPL uh, licensed, this is a GPL licensed model. And now anything that we ever built on top of this, either we can delete it or we can, you know, we need to make it open source as well, which could be a huge, huge business loss um, right there in, in, in either case. Um, so you'll definitely need to look hard at the um, at the uh, the licensing of the output for for the model. I'm I'm not going to go through this workflow again because we're you're pretty familiar here. Um, and then then the last thing I would say uh, on this is that if you ever have a, a denied request, which you very well may, you you probably want to allow the opportunity to have um, to have the business stakeholders revisit it uh, or have the entire team revisit the decision in a certain period of time, you know, say, hey, we'll, we'll allow you to reopen this in a quarter, in a year, what have you, because that way, you know, people will, will say, okay, well, I know once, once this vendor hits these milestones or once we do A, B, and C, then we can try again. Um, that way you don't have this kind of constant lobbying to, hey, we need, we really need this tool. We really need this tool. If you set a re review period and some criteria for that, uh, for that kind of reopening of the question, then that can kind of streamline your process there. Okay, so any questions on this specific workflow? Uh, I'm gonna open it up for, for general questions later, but I wanna talk specifically about the um, the issue of the open source LLM. Any any issues there? Any questions? You will open for general question, right? I have a generic question rather than um, okay. On this, give me one second. Give me one second. I will I will certainly get to your generic question. Um, uh, let me just do one more thing, and then we'll 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 get to it. Okay. Uh, so my my last. Uh, kind of promotional activity here is again mentioning the uh, the cohort that's upcoming. We're doing those four sessions. Um, feel free if you want to do a one on one call with me and or Rob, please please do so. Um, I will send out my Calendly link with uh, with that email that I mentioned, and you know happy to talk more in depth uh, if you want uh, about this course, about what we're going to cover, about what you're going to be equipped to do at the end of it and uh, really want to make sure that is a value uh, add exercise for, for everyone involved. And Rob and I are very confident that it will be. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And I will pause there and that uh, general question, please, please send it my way. Go ahead. Hey, Walter and Rob, thanks. This is Monish Sharavat. Uh, I work for Verizon. Um, my question is more concerned around the consumer side of it. So what the, the what my understanding of, of the training so far has been more around how this SOP can be used by the organizations to to be more ready for the AI cyber risk. And, and that's that has a value in itself. The, the reason I came for the, the primarily for the meeting was to understand from a little different angle and wanted to understand if that is also under the preview of your scope and, and, and thing. So with all these devices, IoT devices, and uh, all, all the possible exposure that in a, in a, in a users are going to have and AI bots are going to be created, I don't see a solution out there in the market that is there to protect the consumers. Not a single company, in my understanding, are, are working to safeguard users' privacy data or, or like users' overall connectivity being, being secure. Any, any guide, guidance on that? Is there any policy being worked upon? Is there anything that is being worked upon to defend against the AI by using the AI? Yeah, great, great question. And to address specifically the scope of the course, this is this is a kind of a B2B focused um, cohort. We, we're going to do more kind of the governance side from, from inside an organization, but it's still a very good question about what can individual consumers do to protect themselves, um, you know, from having their data used in, in ways that they don't want. Uh, I'll, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you a concrete example of things that you can do. And in fact, I even wrote a blog about it. So, um, let me, One thing you should do is you should opt out of chat GPT data sharing. 
Uh, and my art, my blog post, which I, I'm happy to, well, you can see the URL here, um, and I'll, I'll send this out with the with the email afterwards. This tells you step by step how to go through and how to um, opt out of data sharing when using ChatGPT. Um, there are other steps you can take as well. For example, you can um, add something to your robots.txt file on your website to prevent OpenAI or other AI agents from from scraping it, uh, and then kind of at a higher level, there are certainly regulatory moves to limit um, the use of AI in certain situations. I know the EU's Artificial Intelligence Act is potentially going to prohibit the use of AI for biometric analysis in public places. So for example, facial recognition, it's, it's going to prevent that if it, if it goes through. And then the, the United States as well is, uh, is probably going to see a move to regulate AI, although it's been actually a little so, bit slower th than Europe in, yes. that, in that respect following that it's very slow in the us thank you for that sir i will look into this and uh, we'll try to see if, if i can book a, a a free call with you or all as you mentioned i will try to have more discussion around it if, if possible great great um yeah i i think as far as from the consumer side that I'm, i might be a little tapped out of, of knowledge but happy to talk more about the course and and governance it's, uh, from, it's from the not directly right consumer side, it's more of B two B two C. Like we're looking it. to see if, if it's like it's, it has a B two B scope as well, but organizations need to look into from B two B two C perspective so that consumers are also safeguard. Consumer like uh, individually cannot prevent themselves, so it mm -hmm. has to be big organizations taking responsibility for that also. So like, wanted to have that kind of discussion and understanding if possible. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. All right. Any other questions before we before we wrap this up? I know I'm I'm standing between you and Friday afternoon, so I really appreciate everyone's attention here.